I'm Jim Harrison. I uh, started judo back in 1954, and uh, I was down at the downtown YNCA in St. Louis. And there was a young man from, uh, it was in the Air Force, he was at Bellevue, which is about 40 miles east of St. Louis. And he was uh, teaching judo there, so I went down and joined his club. He taught once a week, but about three months they shipped him out. So I didn't have an instructor for quite a while. In the meantime, I'd uh, gotten married and had a couple of children and children. And back in 1957, uh, a man named Bob Kurth, who was from St. Louis, and went up to Chicago to train. He trained with the Japanese in Japan and uh, in the part of the occupational force and in Okinawa. He was a Navy commando, and which most people don't know we had commandos in. That was basically their, before their SEAL teams. They couldn't carry weapons. They had to, I mean, couldn't carry firearms. They had to kill. They would basically like, like uh, Marine Recon is now. What they would do is they would go in and recon the place for the Marines when they hit the beach uh, and the UDT when they came in to take out the pillboxes and the barriers and things like that. And uh, so they had to either kill barehanded with knife, garrote, or whatever else they were allowed to use a firearm because that would give give it away. So they'd rather lose them than have them have the enemy know what they were doing. So he was real strong on street defense and fighting. In fact, as a matter of fact. He had three jobs. <clears throat> he worked as a uh, printer during the day, and then he uh, taught judo until about 11 o'clock at night in his dojo, and then he would go out and play the clar clar clarinet at some of uh, the uh, country western bars and bounce in the bar, to, and was the head bouncer in the bar at the same place. And so I trained with him, and finally after I made my green belt, he asked me if I wanted to help him teach, and I said, well, sure. He says, what do you want? Uh, what do you want me to teach? He said, I want you to teach some self-defense and jujitsu techniques. And I says, well, uh, and I, had, I, I had some. I says, what do you want me to teach? He says, well, what I'll do each night. He says, I'll go through with you. What he would do is come home from being a printer, and he wanted to get, he only got about four hours sleep a night, so he wanted to get an extra hour. So he'd sleep for an hour or so between being a printer and open up his dojo. But his one class started at six o'clock, so he got me to teach that class. And every night I'd get there a little early, and he'd show me what he wanted me to teach, even though I'd never done it before. And we usually had about 30 people a month sign up. But we, uh, and then after that, they all converted into the judo club. But he taught strictly a competitive judo club. And uh, if you didn't want to go to tournaments, learn to fight and competition, and go to tournaments, then you didn't last very long. So. Usually those people lasted about two months, a month with me, then a month with him, and that was a ball game. But I trained, kept training with him until I made my black belt. One day while I was still a brown belt there, a big guy walked in the dojo and said, uh, does anybody here do karate? And I says, what? He says, anybody here do karate? And I says, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And then I remembered Bob uh, Kurth and I, uh, I, somebody had given me a Masoyama's book called What is Karate? And uh, we called it K-Rate. So when we thought all the poses and the, and the things, he showed a lot of katas in it, and we thought those were fighting stances and so forth. So, and we didn't, we'd also, they talked about kumite and sparring, but we didn't know you weren't, you were supposed to pull your punches. So he and I'd get out there and fight, and well, he just kicked my ass most of the time. And, uh, basically all the time, but and we just ended up, you know, I, it, get, I ended up getting the hell beat out of me all the time. We called it Jiu-Jitsu um, Kumite. I'm not Kumite, Jiu-Jitsu Randori. Kumite is the fighting, the term for fighting in Karate. So after this guy went over the word Karate two or three times, I finally figured it out and I says, hell no, this is, uh, we can't even say it right. And I told him we called it K-Rate. And he laughed, but anyway, he talked to Bob, and Bob gave him a class, so I joined that class. And I trained with him for a while, and then he somehow ended up uh, uh, leaving the area or going over. I think he went over and opened up his own school someplace uh, else in St. Louis or in a small town outside of St. Louis. And then uh, I continued with my judo, made my black belt, fought in a lot of competitions, fought in my first national championships as a brown belt. Uh, got into the semifinals, which means there was eight guys left, so it was basically a four-way tie for fifth place at that time, as in about 1962. 
and then uh, I would look up and find I would find somebody that taught karate, so I would work with them. And I, I didn't like learning the katas, but I had to. So I was basically learn their katas, and then I would spar with them until I got to where I could pretty well beat them, and then I'd go look for somebody I could teach a little better, and I'd travel several different places. I was a, a police officer at the time, and I often had to go uh, go pick prisoners up from other, and extradite them from other uh, uh, cities or take people from St. Louis to other cities, but mostly I, I had to go do pickups. Most of the places did their own pickup. So when I would go there, I'd always look for a dojo, either karate or judo or both, and then I'd get the a hotel the closest to them because normally there was anywhere from two days to a week's worth of paperwork I had to do before I could get the prisoner and bring him back. So I got to train in a lot of different systems. And uh, eventually I earned a black belt in, uh, first of all, Shotokan, then Goju-ru, then uh, Kyokyushin, then Mudakwan, and finally in Shoenru. And uh, I, was, did, I was teaching at the YMCA because Bob Kurth lost his uh, lease at the building he had and lost his dojo, so I went down and opened up a club at the YMCA and I had a student named Jim Lindell that would help me. He was, he was a green belt when he came from California and then he made it, made it brown under uh, Bob, so, and I, was, I just made my black. So uh, we, uh, we were teaching at the YMCA and then I, uh, I was also working as a police officer at that time and I ended up with a gunshot wound to the leg. And while I was in the hospital, he went to uh, Kansas City and uh, called me back and says, they're having a big tournament here. He said, uh, you want to compete? I said, well, hell, I'm in the hospital. He says, well, that's never slowed you down before. So anyway, I went AWOL out of the hospital and went to Kansas City and competed in the judo tournament. I happened to win it, but it caused an infection in my leg, so they had to put me back in the hospital. And then while I was there, he called me up and he says, uh, I bought Wei San Kim's dojo. It was in the uh, downtown area of uh, Kansas City. And it was in a real bad area. If you didn't have a black belt, you didn't even want to go down in that area or a Tommy gun. So anyway, the first time I went away well, from the hospital again, I walked in the door of the dojo and the first thing I said to him, we got to find another location. So eventually we found a location out uh, way out south of Kansas City in the suburbs a place in a pretty well-to-do neighborhood. We opened up a dojo there and did very well. And then he got married and his wife and I couldn't get along, so we split up. He opened up over in a place called Raytown, Missouri. I kept that dojo. I hired a Korean to help me teach. Uh, he was a Korean champion and uh, judo, not, not uh, taekwondo. I stuck to my karate. And actually I blended my st styles of karate together. I just took the strongest techniques from each one and, and then I also basically did very few katas. I just had one kata for every belt instead of a whole bunch of katas. Got sick and tired of doing katas. Didn't see a lot of value in them. It does help, it does help you get good form, and form is important, but uh, we spent too much time on form and not enough time on fighting. So when I opened up my own school, I just named the school Bushido Khan, which means Warrior's Way. And uh, I. Uh, when I sent my first suit certificates in, I didn't, it said style, and I didn't know what style to put down because I didn't know exactly what I was teaching. I was teaching a conglomerate of several different styles of karate. And so I just left it open. When I came back, it had the name of my school, and it was, was Bushido Khan. And consequently, it eventually turned into a style which is recognized United States wide and worldwide. And then uh, from, from karate, when karate in 72, um, Anyway, to get back to it, I won several regional judo championships, but then in 68, when I went to the uh, Missouri Valley Judo Championships, they wouldn't give me an AAU card because I was, uh, I had my own dojo and was teaching, but there was a lot of other guys across the country that owned their own dojo and teaching, but they got AAU cards because they weren't winning. So I basically had to drop judo and I concentrated on karate for a while and I won, um, the All-American Championship, Grand Championship three times, U.S. Championship, U.S. Uh, Invitational Championships a couple of times, several other national championships. Um, back in those days, what they called the 60s, they called the blood and guts era of karate, where basically you could pull a point, 
pull a punch if it looked like it would really hurt a guy, you got a point. Or you could knock him out with it or break his nose with it and you still got a point. If he couldn't get back up and fight in five minutes, then he was disqualified. So there was, was well, that's why they called it the blood and guts era. So from that, and then they started calling penalty points, or what we call California points, where if you hit a guy too hard, they give a penalty against you. And the other guy got the point. And uh, it got to be where you had to learn to beat the referees, more concentrate on beating the referees more than uh, judges than you did the uh, your opponent. So from that, kickboxing came along. Joe Lewis had his first kickboxing match in January 1970. And I worked each corner. He fought a guy named Greg Baines, a big, uh, strong black guy that was a real good boxer too. And he was also a second, third degree black belt under Ed Parker. And I worked Joe's corner and Joe took him out in the second round. He hit the guy, but he didn't realize that he had almost knocked the guy out. And Joe backed off and I had to yell at him to get in there and finish him off and he did. So in June, there was a chance to come up. For, uh, they were gonna fight, uh, they didn't have any, uh, they, they formed the United States Kickboxing Association. And so we, they kind of, uh, we had some preliminary matches and it came down to where it was basically Joe Lewis and uh, Ed Daniel fought the, uh, for the United States Championships and I fought Vic Moore for the United States Kickboxing Championships. And we was, there was virtually no rules, rules. You could kick to the knees, you could kick to the groin, you could throw, you could use elbows, knees, uh, the only thing is, like for example, I threw Vic in about the first uh, 20 seconds, but I threw him on his head and knocked him out. And the, the arm, uh, I can't think of his first name, but a big guy named Armstrong was the referee. And he walked over to Alan Steen and Chuck Norris and says, uh, well, I know throwing is legal, but I don't know if I can count, can I count it as a knockout? And the head of the association was a guy that, that put the money in the association named Lee Faulkner. And between Alstein and Lee Faulkner, they said, uh, well, the throws are legal, but we, we don't want to have, we can't have a 20 second uh, championship match there. So we continue the fight. And he headbutted me and cut me. And uh, I was, they, they, what, the doctor says, I can't sew it up. I don't have anything to sew it up with. And somebody says, well, I got some, they're just kidding. He says, I got a staple gun. And I says, get it. And the guy went to his briefcase and got the staple gun, handed it to the doctor. So the doctor just pulled my eyelid out where I was cut all the way to the bone and put about five staples from a little Bosch stitch staple gun into my eye. And I went out and finished the fight, knocked Vic Moore out. And then after that, I got a chance. Uh, I, would, I had a guy named John Keehan that would, since I didn't have many, there weren't many people wanting to kickbox at that time or to start with. And so he fixed me up with a few fights called karate versus boxer, but I couldn't kick below the legs. I couldn't kick to the, I mean, below the waist. I couldn't kick the legs and knees or groin or any place else. So I did just in order to have somebody to fight, I did a few of those. And then he put a thing together that with a, a Japanese uh, karate or promoter or martial arts promoter, I don't know what. John Keane was kind of billed as Count Dante and he didn't, uh, none of the media liked him very well because of that. They thought he was kind of a hot dog, but actually he was a real good fighter and a good instructor. He just didn't, didn't come across to, to most people the way they wanted it to. So he made up a team and he took, took uh, a team to the unit to, uh, we fought uh, two matches in Thailand, two matches in Japan, and one match in, in Korea. And I happened to win all my fights by knockout all of them in the first round except the uh, one in Japan that took me five rounds to get in because fighting one of their former champions and then from there I came back and I fought some more a uh, couple more kickboxing matches but I was having trouble getting fights and stuff and I was staying in real good shape and I had uh, some real good fighters so since I couldn't get any more fights I concentrated more on just teaching my other fighters and at one time in my dojo in uh, Kansas City I had uh, five of the PKA national champions in one school. I had uh, the lightweight champion who was Jeff Payne, I had the, the welterweight champion who was Ray Patton, the middleweight champion was Mark Payne, and the light heavyweight champion was Steve Mackey who eventually became the shoot boxing champion of um, the world. He beat uh, Cesar uh, Takashi in Japan at the Budokai um, in the second round. And Steve had a shoulder, had had three shoulder replacements 
Back in those days, they weren't very, they weren't very good and they didn't last long and he wore them out real quick. So he basically fought it one-handed, but he hit, uh, he took Takashi out in the second round and they actually pronounced him dead in the ring. They put a towel over his head, took him out of the ring on a stretcher, took him back to his dressing room. Steve got down on his knees in the mat, he's kind of a religious guy, and he prayed and promised if he'd, uh, if, promised to God if, if Takashi lived, he wouldn't ever fight in the ring again. And Takashi was left for his family in the, to come and pick up at the, uh, in his dressing room, and they left one of his corner men in there with him. And after about two hours, Takashi sets up and says to the equivalent in Japanese, what happened? <laughs> And anyway, he came around, he, he was just knocked out but he, and, and almost in a coma. So a couple of sumo wrestlers come and got him and carried him out and they went to have dinner. And anyway, Steve became a very, very popular person in Japan at that time because of him praying for uh, Takashi to live after he knocked him out. And then, then in 70, uh, I fought in Japan and they, they asked me who, uh, uh, what style I had, and I told them Bushido Khan, and they said, oh, Steve Mackey. So they remembered Steve and me both, so that's how my style more or less got started. And now I teach a system of what I call Ronin Jutsu, which Ronin means a masterless one or kind of a rogue warrior. And I concentrate, uh, I have some good good kickboxers. I have uh, one world champion, I have Rosh, Bar Rosh Barnett, who beat Randy Couture for the world championship, and then went to Japan in pride because Dana White kind of uh, wouldn't pay him what he told him was going to and claimed he passed and claimed that he couldn't pass a uh, uh, steroid test which they didn't even give but anyway I still teach uh, I do seminars and I teach uh, mixed martial arts judo jiu-jitsu we I, I work with a lot of Brazilian guys specifically the Machado and the Bay Ring families they're real nice people and they're just deadly as a python on the ground and uh, I have uh, I teach judo, jiu-jitsu, karate com combination, a combination of karate kickboxing, and then when my guys get to a certain point, I let them do mixed martial arts. But I make them get real good at stand-up kickboxing, stand-up judo, and ground fighting, and jiu-jitsu, and, uh, and then we switch to uh, mixed martial arts, and I'll let them fight there at that. And uh, other than that, I just I kind of do a lot of seminars for self-defense. Uh, particularly uh, hardcore self-defense and for police academies and military and stuff like that. One of my specialties is disarming people with weapons. And uh, that's about all the time we got for this interview.